Don't let me interrupt y'all. Sounds like interesting conversation. Um, what's that? It's talking about the AC. Yeah, it's appropriately cool in here, isn't it? <laughs> uh, let me start with some uh, opening comments uh, on the Middle East. This weekend, Iran launched an unprecedented air attack on Israel. Ultimately, the defensive effort to intercept Iran's drones and missiles was effective, successfully preventing what could have been a significant loss of life. This was a shared success, and the United States is proud to have played a critical role in it. Over the past two days following the attack, the President and the Secretary have consulted extensively with partners in the region and around the world. Secretary Blinken spoke yesterday with the foreign ministers from Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Germany, and the United Kingdom, and he continues to make calls with foreign counterparts today. We will continue to emphasize the importance that the international community act as a united front in condemning such reckless, escalatory acts. Such behavior threatens to destabilize the region and endangers all its people, and Iran's attack violated the sovereignty of several states in the region. I also want to be absolutely clear. The United States' commitment to Israel's security is sacrosanct. Our contributions to Israel's defense against Iran are a clear manifestation of that commitment. So too are our efforts to advance a ceasefire of at least six weeks in Gaza, which would secure the release of all remaining hostages and create a pathway to a more enduring peace. We remain committed to advancing that work and providing lasting peace and security for Israel, for the Palestinian people, and for the broader region. And we will continue to engage regional and international partners urgently on these areas in the coming days. With that? Well, that's it. Matt? I thought you said you had a couple of different comments. That seemed like one. Okay. But that's fine. Uh, um, on one topic. This, Several comments, one topic. Gotcha. Um, on, on this, just uh, uh, logistically, who has the Secretary spoken to, to other than the Iraqis, obviously? Uh, he um, has a, I will have a list of the, or readouts of those coming. I don't have any to read out right now, but have readouts coming throughout the day. He's got been, calls scheduled for this afternoon and it's completed some already, but I need to make sure those are ones uh, we're publicly reading out. Okay, and I know you guys don't want to talk about this, but when you say that uh, the uh, Iranian attack violated the sovereignty of several countries in the region, which countries are you talking about, and which countries actually took action? So with respect to the first question, so the attack violated not just obviously Israel's sovereignty, but you saw missiles launch from Iran and fly over other countries in the region. Such as? Uh, I'm not going to speak to those. I'll defer to my colleague. Right. Oh, hold okay. on. I will, well, no, hold say, on. Let me say, I will defer to they my. They didn't fly over Australia. I, I will, so, so, where, 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 so where did they fly over? I will say two things. One, you can look at the flight path. But two, I will defer to my pen, not colleagues at the Pentagon who are more, situate, more appropriately situated to speak to that question. Um, and when it comes to um, responding to that attack and um, uh, work to assist Israel in its defense, I will let any other countries that were involved speak to their uh, Well, are there any that you care to um, or not care? I will, I, will, I will speak on behalf of the United States and let any other country speak for itself. Um, okay. And so uh, your understanding, though, is that, that there was at least uh, one Patriot missile uh, battery that uh, brought down a, uh, a missile... Uh, in, in Erbil that was going over Iraqi airspace? So with any uh, of those types of questions, I'm going to defer to my colleagues at the Pentagon. It's just, yeah, I'm just not going to already. speak to... So you can't say that? Uh, I'm not going to speak to um, military matters from here. I'm, one, it's not appropriate. Two, I'd probably get it wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'm done. Oh, well, I have some stuff on Iraq, but okay. bilateral stuff. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Hi, Matt. Um, so you've been, U.S. has been cautioning Israel about its retaliation. I'm wondering what's the most recent steer you're getting from Israel on what kind of further retaliation they're going to... I'm, I'm just not going to speak to uh, our private diplomatic conversations. When we have um, talked to Israel, we have made clear, as we demonstrated on Saturday, that we are committed to their defense. Um, and, of course, we are, uh, continue to make clear to everyone that we talk to that we want to see de-escalation, de de that we don't want to see this conflict further escalated. We don't want to see a wider regional war. That's something that's been the goal of this administration since October 7th, and we have worked to achieve. But beyond that, I don't want to get into private what diplomatic would be, in, in U.S. view, what would be an un acceptable or unacceptable retaliation? I'm just not going to speak to, to hypothetical, hypotheticals. 
Okay, let me let me go at this a little bit more. It's taken you months to convince Israel on a number of things, like aid to Gaza, how they're conducting their military operation in Gaza. What makes you think they're going to heed your warning this time? So uh, again, I'm not going to always accept the premise of the of the question. So don't take that um, uh, uh, in my response. Israel is a sovereign country. They have to make their own decisions about how best to defend themselves. What we always try to do is provide our best advice as a longtime friend of Israel and a longtime ally and partner of Israel. And that's what we've done since October 7th across a broad range of fronts. It's what we have done over the weekend. And so what we demonstrated the, over the weekend is that our commitment to Israel's defense is clear and it is ironclad, and we back that up not just with words and with action. And we will continue to make that clear, while at the same time uh, ensuring that everyone knows that we are committed to de-escalation in the region, and that's the policy we're trying to pursue. All right. On the UN, uh, Robert Wood said yesterday, in the coming days and in consultation with other members, the U.S. will explore additional measures to hold their own accountable here at the United Nations. Can you give like any clues on what that might be? Include. So we have been consulting with partners on this very question over the past several days. When I um, uh, read out the secretary's calls, uh, one of the things that he we have talked about in those calls are any further actions to hold Iran accountable for its behavior. If you have seen this administration take action since day one to hold Iran accountable, we have put uh, more than 500 sanctions in place uh, on Iran and Iran uh, uh, in Iranian entities. And we will continue to hold them accountable, but I don't have any, any specific measures to announce today. Yeah, go ahead. Um, understood that you don't know exactly when Israel is going to go ahead or don't uh, feel the need to share it, but um, is the U.S. expectation that Israel uh, will share with the U.S. before they actually retaliate? I'm just not going to get into those private conversations between our two countries. The U.S. hasn't asked to, you know, look at what their plans are before they go ahead. We are in close contact with Israel at a number of different levels uh, at the White House, uh, between this uh, this building and Israeli counterparts, as well as with the Pentagon. But as to the substance of those conversations, uh, I think I'll keep them private. And then, obviously, uh, the U.S. was hand in hand with Israel uh, defending against this attack over the weekend. Can you speak to how you think that might impact the way that Israel responds? Do you think that they felt supported by the U.S. and regional allies as they were under assault um, that might make them you know, feel like they're in a better place today than they would have been defending themselves on their own? So I can't speak for Israel. I would never want to speak for another country. I'll speak for the United States. Um, but I will say what you saw over the, over the weekend, and really it's something that started before the weekend, was a coordinated response to defend Israel, something that we worked very hard with our Israeli counterparts to put into place. It's not like when these attacks were launched uh, Saturday afternoon, our time, Saturday evening, Sunday morning, uh, Israeli time, that it was something that we had not been preparing for with Israel in the days uh, leading up to that attack. We had been working quite closely with them to coordinate our response, to talk about how we could defend Israel, how we could take down those drones and missiles, and something we worked very closely on as well as we um, coordinated with our diplomatic response. As you saw, the secretary um, had a number of calls with foreign counterparts last week to, to send messages indirectly to Iran, to ask other countries to make clear to Iran um, that they should not uh, escalate this conflict. We shared all of those conversations with the government of Israel, made clear to them that we were working not just with them, not just militarily, but that we were working with them diplomatically. And that's what we are committed to continue to do to defend the state of Israel and the people of Israel. And are the Rafa meetings still going to happen this week? I don't have any scheduling announcements to make with regards to those meetings. Go ahead. Um, come to in a similar vein, that uh, the, the fact that Israel didn't take a preemptive strike and that uh, the US and others were, were warning that, that, that a strike from Iran an attack from Iran would likely be coming. Um, there was no preemptive strike. So it, should we read that as it, it's that the US and allies have been successful in actually stopping Israel from doing what it might otherwise normally do? And also the secretary spoke about this this morning um, alongside uh, uh, the Iraqi PM, but the, he said that in the next, in the 36 hours since the attack, this uh, diplomatic response and seeking to prevent escalation will continue from the U.S. So we, are we supposed to see that as a as primarily aimed at, at Israel, given that the ball is now in Israel's court? So with respect to the first question, I'm always reluctant to kind of 
tell people how to read any one thing or the other. I'm just going to speak to our, our actions, which we uh, have already done at length. With respect to the next 36 hours, though, to follow up on, on what the Secretary has said, we are making clear to everyone in the region that we don't want to see the conflict escalated. And that is a message that we have sent not just starting this weekend, not just last week, but really since October 7th. Um, if you've paid attention to the Secretary's trips, and I know you have, and a lot of people in this uh, room have been on these trips, one of the things we have always talked about and that we have engaged intensively in diplomacy to try to pursue is a de-escalation of the conflict and to prevent the conflict from spreading and widening. I don't know how many times you've heard the Secretary say that. I don't know how many times you've heard me say it. And of course, uh, if you've heard us say it, you can imagine how many times our counterparts across the region and across the world have heard us say it, because it has been one of the primary strategic objectives we have been uh, pursuing and that we will continue to pursue in the days ahead. Yes. A quick follow on that UN angle. There's some criticism today that the UN missile sanctions on Iran that expired in October last year somehow enabled this attack. How do you respond to that? So uh, I would say, uh, first off, um, that's just absolutely not true. But uh, and, and to get into kind of the facts of that, Iran has a ballistic missile and drone program that has been building for years, well before those sanctions uh, expired, and that were uh, that work continued not just uh, in administrations going back decades, but under the previous administration's watch. So Iran has continued to pursue these destabilizing activities. But we have, what we have done is, at the same time, held Iran accountable for its destabilizing activities, and that includes. Um, sanctioning, uh, as I said, imposing more than 500 sanctions on Iran and Iranian uh, entities since the outset of this administration, and we will continue to hold them accountable as appropriate. Well, hold on. All, all, all that's well and good, but <laughs> the fact of the matter is that there were sanctions that were in place on it to try and curtail that program. There continue and to you be. you guys, and, 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 and they were dropped. I mean, they, they expired. There continue to be other sanctions on Iran's missile programs. And uh, as I said, we continue to um, look at ways that we can tighten our sanctions, uh, increase the enforcement of our sanctions, and if necessary, impose new sanctions on Iran. But they have a ballistic missile program that goes back yes. years, decades. They did, which and is we, why and, the and, sanctions and, were introduced and, in the first and, place. And, 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 it's and why, you and guys it's, let, them, and it's, let, it's, let them expire it's why along, with it's, the, uh, it is, along with the general arms embargo. And it is why we have uh, sanctions on their ballistic missile program. We'll continue yeah, but, to look but, for but, new sanctions. But you don't have the same sanctions that you had in place before. We do have sanctions on their ballistic missile programs. and 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 have imposed, as I said, 500 sanctions, over 500 sanctions total with right. respect to Iran, and will continue to look to hold them accountable. But it's clearly they're not working. The sanctions are not working. Uh, Iran has, has for years tried to evade sanctions uh, imposed by the United States, imposed by our European allies, imposed by um, uh, the United Nations. But what we have seen the sanctions do is drive up the cost for Iran to do business, slow down their weapons programs. Uh, and ultimately, at times, I think you can see them produce uh, less effective weapons. Uh, I probably shouldn't get into that in detail, but less effective weapons than they otherwise would. Uh, one more, uh, Matt. Did you clearly ask Israel not to retaliate? And in case they uh, they responded, uh, will you continue to defend Israel? Uh, I am just not going to get into the private diplomatic conversations we've had with Israel. But that said, we have made clear privately and publicly that we are committed to Israel's defense. That will always be true. Uh, that commitment remains ironclad. It will not change. And if there are further attacks on Israel, of course, we will continue to defend them. I just had a follow on Michelle regarding this. I mean, you are now pressuring Israel not to respond on the Iranian attack, and at the same time saying that if if they've been attacked, you will defend them. Do, do, do you see that this was counterproductive to what you're trying to do? You're enabling them to respond to Iran while you're saying to them, we'll protect you when Iran retaliates back. So uh, first of all, you are, um, there are couple things in your questions I have not said from this podium. Um, I'm not going to speak to our private diplomatic conversations and what we are sharing with Israel uh, privately. But publicly, of course, we are committed to the defense of Israel. And there is, um, that, that is something that the president has made clear from day one, something you've heard the secretary say clear. 
and it's something that will continue to be the case. And I think, but if I could get at kind of a broader issue, I think inherent in your question, there have been times over the past six months since October 7th that Israel has taken actions with which we don't agree, or Israel hasn't moved as quickly uh, as we would like to implement certain changes. And we engage with them uh, on those issues, and we try to get improvements, uh, and we will continue to, to try and do that. But at a fundamental level, there is a bond between the United States and the people of Israel. And that bond rests on our shared security. And one of the things that we will continue to be committed to is the defense of that security. And do you willing to risk a regional total war for this? I think you've heard me say uh, here a number of times that we are working to pursue de-escalation. Uh, and that has been the focus of our diplomacy since October 7th, not just over the weekend, but since day one, is trying to pursue de-escalation and prevent the conflict from widening uh, and spreading and expanding. Last question, but I want to go back to a statement you issued uh, an hour earlier about West Bank violence. You started the statement by saying, we strongly condemn the murder of 13-year-old Israeli Benjamin Achimaya. And the second paragraph, you say, we are also increasingly concerned by the violence against Palestinians that led to the death of two Palestinians. Why the distinction? There is no distinction. We condemn the, the uh, we condemn all loss of innocent life. But why the, the change of word? The wording is different. Uh, I think you're reading too much into the um, uh, the formulation of the statement. We condemn all loss of innocent life, whether it be Israeli or Palestinian, and mm -hmm. that's why we mentioned all three individuals who died in that statement. I, I think maybe you should put them all in the same sentence. Happy to take happy to take your I mean, I'm, 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 happy, I'm happy to take your I'm happy to take drafting <laughs> suggestions, but look if you look at that I, I, I think the statement was was pretty clear that we condemn violence against Palestinian civilians just as we condemn violence against Israeli civilians. Thank you. The USMC in Israel noted that the threat of drone and missile barrages diminished over the weekend when it lifted its shelter-in-place order for U.S. government officials, but the travel restrictions are still in place for those personnel. Is that something that's going to be the posture going forward, or do you anticipate lifting those as well? That, that is something that we monitor on a real-time basis and make assessments. Uh, you saw us issue that security alert over the weekend when uh, there were drones and missiles in the, in the sky, and when that threat receded, we lifted um, that security alert. As opposed, When it comes to the, um, the policy that we put in place for U.S. Embassy personnel and their family members, it's something we'll continue to look at um, and make any adjustments that circumstances warrant. We have seen some major airlines cancel flights out of Tel Aviv. Is there any concern at this point about U.S. citizens being able to transit in and out of the country safely? Uh, we have not seen uh, uh, U.S. citizens have difficulty leaving or getting into Israel. Obviously, there has been um, a decrease in commercial travel since October 7th. We saw it plummet first, and then options come back uh, uh, online over time. Um, it's not something that we've seen any long-term changes or, uh, to over the past few days, but of course we will continue to monitor the situation. Uh, any more uh, on the region before we move before we move on? Alex, do you really have one on the region? Yeah. Just, go, uh, go ahead. I, I, thank you much. You just described perfectly well how successfully U.S. and allies, you know, came up with coordinated response. They defended their ally against drones and missiles coming from terrorists. This is exactly what the Ukrainian people have been asking for. I knew this was not going to be about the region, Alex. I mean, <laughs> I, you, so first of all, I will take the question, but you know I'm always going to call, call on you. I was yeah. trying to finish out in the region before the, coming the, back the to, to, I, the re, to the rest of the world. Go, go the, ahead. But. The question I, I keep hearing from, from the Ukrainian people is why do you think they don't deserve the same? Uh, if you look at, the, at our commitment to Ukraine, it has included significant provision of missile defense uh, to allow the Ukrainian military to shoot down drones and missiles uh, and attacks on the Ukrainian people. That is something that this administration is committed to with billions and billions of dollars in weapon systems, and it's not just American weapon systems, but we have worked to source air defense systems from around the world to help defend the Ukrainian people against uh, 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 Russian attacks. But what happened in Israel last week happens in Ukraine every week. And it bears, I mean, I don't know if we cover this every day, that the Ukrainians are facing the same drones coming from Iran and they give, they give, give it to Russia to attack on them. My question is, uh, Alex, which, one, which U.S. that they have seen on TV yesterday, which U.S. is the true friend of Ukraine? So, Alex, I am just going to completely uh, reject the premise of that question. I don't think it accurately represents uh, the United States' commitment to Ukraine. Um, we have been committed to Ukraine since day one. 
uh, and our record bears that out. When you look at the international coalition that we have assembled to respond to, to Russia's aggression, to hold Russia accountable through sanctions and export control uh, measures, and again, through the provision of weapon systems, and I mentioned air defense because that's most relevant to your question, but other systems as well, offensive systems that they have used the, to take the fight to the Russian army and reclaim half the territory that, that uh, Russia took from them. So um, I think the premise of the question, frankly, is just a bit absurd because it does not match the reality of our record when it comes to supporting the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian military. Let me go, let me go, on, let me, let me go back to someone, in the, back to later on. someone in the region. Go ahead, fine. Yeah, go ahead. Me? Yeah. All right, thank you uh, for the Italian television. So we heard the president saying that um, he's, he will support Israel, but he doesn't want an escalation. So, But Netanyahu doesn't seem to be listening too much to this ally. He just go his own way for his political reason, although the ally keeps supporting Israel. So in case of a further escalation, will the U.S. Um, willing to be involved in a potential war toward Iran, I, and I, which other countries in the region will might join the U.S.? So this is a little bit similar to some of the other questions in which it uh, asked me to speak to a hypothetical that I'm not going to do. But that said, we have made very clear that we do not seek war with Iran, uh, that we've made that clear multiple times over the weekend and, of course, since uh, October 7th. But they will okay. join if case Israel needs war. I, I, I just don't want to speak to, to any hypotheticals. We oh. are committed to Israel's defense, and we showed that over the weekend, but we want to uh, achieve de-escalation, and we do not want to see a wider. Can I do a follow-up for Israel? the Saudi and the Jordan, because they're supporting the U.S. and Israel? What kind of um, talks are you guys having, that you, if you can say something about it? So we, so uh, the secretary did consult with the foreign ministers of Jordan and Saudi Arabia over the weekend um, to, as I said in my opening comments, make clear the United States position that we uh, want to see de-escalation in the region. We want to um, uh, continue to pursue it. But then on a broader level, of course, he has been consulting with those two governments, as he has with other partners in the region, about a path to resolving the conflict in Gaza. Um, and that's something that we continue to, to work on. Israel? Any more on the region? Israel. Okay. Right. Israel. Go, go ahead before I go to the rest of the world. Um, I've had a few, I've had a, after having one pivot, one pivot away from the region under false pretenses, I'm going to try to be a little more sure. Um, I just want to ask a little bit, Matt, about the messaging with Iran through different countries. Um, so U.S. yesterday denied the Iranian assertion that they were given 72 hours of notice of the strikes. Um, you don't mean, though, by denying that you didn't get any notice at all, just to set that clear. No. You have gotten notice. No, we did not get notice from Iran of these strikes. That okay. is not correct. Now, we did have some indication that they were coming. You saw the uh, speak yeah. to them the possibility of them coming publicly. We had an expectation that Iran was going to retaliate in some way, but no, we did not get notification. But there's been plenty of reporting that through Jordanians, Iraqis, and Turks, messages had been passed to the United States. So you, you guys did not interpret that as some sort of a an attempt to give notice? Uh, no, I don't think that's how I, I, I would interpret it. Of course, um, uh, Iran made a bunch of claims in its statements. A lot of things right. that they say about their private statements don't, aren't true. I spoke to, to some of those um, uh, over the weekend. It was our expectation, based on a number of things, that they would attack is Israel. Um, but no, there was no, no notification uh, in that sense from Iran. But I would say, look, if you look at their public comments, in their public comments, they talked about how they were going to respond in some way. And certainly they said that in their private comments. But that's different than, I think, what you mean or how I think people generally consider notification when you take of timing and scope and all, all of those sorts of things. But you, they, were, they, were, they, they said publicly and privately a number of times to anyone that would talk to, that anyone that they talked to, not just the United States but others, that they were going to do something. Um, uh, but in terms of notification, no. Yeah, no, I'm no. just trying to understand what kind of information you have received through these different channels. There was also the Swiss. You, you have received some information through the Swiss. Is that not right? Uh, we did see, uh, re uh, receive information through that channel, through the okay. Swiss Embassy in Tehran. Right. And let me boil down to one specific, because uh, there's been reporting that like a Turkish uh, diplomatic or security source basically saying Iran informed us in advance of in advance of what would happen. Um, possible developments came up during the meeting with Blinken. This is a this is a meeting or a call between Secretary Blinken and Turkish Foreign Minister Hakan Fidan. Um, we were aware of the possibilities, 
Um, they conveyed through us to Iran that this reaction must be within certain limits. So in this exchange, for example, you have not heard from the Turks any detail about these possibilities. I'm just trying to get a sense and a picture of the level of details that you have received about the incoming attack through these different intermediaries? So I will say that there were a number of conversations uh, with foreign interlocutors over the past week. Um, in none of those uh, conversations did we get a notification of the attack or a sense of the targets. Obviously, you heard Iran saying publicly that they were going to respond in a very large sure. way. And so we were prepared for a significant attack. I'm not going to talk about, and I think for reasons that are probably um, probably well understood. I'm not going to talk about all of our, all of the ways in which we gather information about potential attacks. But um, based on our um, assessment of the situation, we did expect that uh, um, Iran would take some action against Israel, which is why you saw us working with Israel to prepare for that attack and to be able to defend against it. Against it. And it's why we were able to successfully do so. Right. And the final thing is about the hostages. Um, what is the sticking point right now? Like. The onus is on on who you would say, and you know whether is the U.S. still pursuing this. Uh, it seems to have been at an impasse. So again. we we are still pursuing this, and I, I will say there is an incredibly significant proposal that went from the United States and Egypt and Qatar and Israel to Hamas last week, um, and Israel moved a sig significant way in submitting that proposal. And there's a deal on the table that would achieve much of what Hamas claims it wants to achieve, and they have not taken that deal. Now, they can speak for themselves about why they haven't taken that deal, but the bottom line is they have rejected it. And if they did accept it, it would allow for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza of at least six weeks that would benefit the Palestinian people. They claim to um, to represent. It would allow us to continue the improvements on the delivery of humanitarian assistance that we have seen over the past week. And those, those improvements have been significant and are ongoing, but if you didn't have active ongoing hostilities, um, the UN and other partners could do even more to get humanitarian assistance in. And the bottom line is Hamas needs to take uh, that deal and they need to explain to the world and to the Palestinian people why they aren't taking it, because it is the Hamas, it is Hamas right now that is a, the barrier and the obstacle to a ceasefire in Gaza. Israel. Uh, Israel. Uh, go ahead. You, go ahead. Right, turn around. Me. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, just want, uh, just want, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, regarding to the, uh, the rubber of uh, 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 the rubble of the uh, of the pier. The, uh, the, uh, uh, we seen all. We seen the rapper. Uh, 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 how they built the the pier from the rapper of uh, the destroyed houses in Gaza uh, from the uh, the uh, remain of the people who killed in Gaza, and this is this pier is uh, uh, is built specially uh, for. Uh, it's built specially to human uh, aid uh, for people of Gaza. This is you do do you uh, do you don't think this is unhuman for uh, and uh, it's uh, a contract with the uh, the purpose of to build this uh, pier. So I'm not going to speak to the specific details regarding the construction of the of the pier, only because that's not work that's. Uh, ongoing through the State Department. That's work that's uh, happening out of the Pentagon, and I would defer to, to the Pentagon to speak to that. But of course, the reason why this administration and this government are working to establish that peer is to get significantly more humanitarian assistance into Gaza. Um, we have seen, uh, as I said a, a moment ago, continued progress on that front over the past few days. Um, we saw a significant amount of trucks go in over the weekend. Uh, we've seen improvements and mechanisms for the delivery of aid. Uh, we saw, I think it's 65 trucks that moved to the north of Gaza yesterday, and they're more slated to go to the north today, something that wasn't happening in any kind of significant number weeks ago. 
We've seen Eras Crossing open for initial deliveries and improvements are being made to it to allow it to handle more traffic. We've seen Ashdod now uh, uh, open for delivery of humanitarian assistance. We've seen, we are seeing repair to water pipes uh, that deliver uh, water into Gaza underway and hopefully completed in the very near future. Now, all of that, uh, go through all those improvements. We, as we have made clear, want to see those improvements uh, sustained and expanded over time. But it is, it is towards that goal of getting more humanitarian assistance that we have uh, decided to pursue the delivery through a maritime option in the first place and nothing else. The U.S. condemned the violence in West Bank between uh, Palestinian and Israeli, but the, uh, the violence uh, uh, from Israeli settlers is uh, uh, under the protection. They, uh, they burned the houses attacking the Palestinians, and uh, you know uh, the, this is under the Israeli protection, Israeli authority protection. Why you don't clearly condemn the Israeli uh, authorities? So we have made not very only between Palestinian, uh, uh, the Palestinian, there is no nobody protect them. Yes, so, so we have made very clear on a number of occasions, and and oftentimes when it comes to breaking news events, we speak to in our statements what we can confirm uh, for a fact at the time, and our understanding of those facts develops over time as we are able to gather new information. So, um, we made clear in the statement we put out today that we strongly condemn the violence. Uh, against Palestinians and their property that ensued uh, in the West Bank over the weekend, resulting in dozens of injuries and the death of two uh, Palestinians, just as we strongly condemn the murder of the 14-year-old Israeli boy. Um, and you have heard us say in the past that we've been incredibly concerned about the Israeli National Police and the IDF not doing enough to stop settler violence, um, and that uh, settler violence needs to be stopped needs to be policed, and those responsible for it need to be held accountable. We have made that very clear, as well as imposing our own sanctions on people involved in violent activities in the West Bank. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank in you in the back. Matt. No. Matt, thank you very much. Um, how do you counter the argument that not striking back against Iran represents an, an appeasement of Iran? So I would say if you look at the actions that we took over the weekend, they were incredibly successful, uh, first of all. That is, the, the, I, I think, the, the number one fact that needs to be established, that the United States showed that we are committed to the defense of Israel, and not just that we are committed to the defense, but that we can be successful in the defense of Israel. And we demonstrated that, and the uh, Israeli military uh, demonstrated that by shooting down the vast majority, overwhelming majority, of the more than 300 uh, missiles and drones that were launched by Iran. And then when it comes to Iran, um, we continue to hold them accountable for their actions, for their destabilizing activities. We have, made, have uh, as I said, imposed more than 500 sanctions on Iran since the outset of this administration. Uh, and we have made clear that we will continue to hold them accountable for their actions. Uh, and uh, we think it's important, as I said, that everyone in the international community condemn Iran. And we've been engaged in diplomatic conversations to that regard over the past few days. But, but, but in a region where de deterrence counts for so much, uh, the fact that Iran was able to, to fire ballistic missiles at Israel proper um, that d does unsuccessfully. that not unsuccessfully unsuccessfully well, largely is, unsuccessfully yes but the it's important it is it is it is I, I only say it because it is yeah. an incredibly important distinction uh, that they were largely largely unsuccessful because of the work that we did um, with Israel but you could argue that that was uh, in part a consequence of the 12 days or so that they publicly announced they were going to do something uh, but does it not the fact they were able to do it largely unsuccessfully does that not for them? give them some sense of deterrence, of reestablishing their own deterrence, which is a problem, is it not, for Israel and America? So you can make all sorts of arguments, um, but at the end of the day, I'm going to look at the results. And the results that we were able to achieve with Israel, yes, in part through our preparation, in part through our long, decades-long security uh, agree agreements uh, and security cooperation, is that we were able to repel that attack, and only a very small number of them uh, succeeded. Uh, and and uh, uh, ultimately, though, ultimately, though, I think the point that I made continues to stand, is that we're going to continue to work to hold Iran accountable. Iran didn't start 
uh, these destabilizing activities over the weekend. They have been a destabilizing force in the region going back for decades. And that is why you have seen us pursue not just uh, actions to hold Iran accountable, but ultimately to isolate Iran. And when you go back to the broader policy that we have been pursuing, um, that includes normalization between Israel and its neighbors, it is to isolate Iran. So you see in Iran, um, uh, that is cut off from the rest of the region uh, and in Israel that is more integrated, which ultimately we think is the long-term answer to the very real security challenges that, uh, that Israel faces. And can I just follow up on that? On that let, me, let me just, because I have a lot, lot of others, let me just go, go ahead and show. Some of the Middle East uh, said that the Iranian attack was a farce, a, de a deception, and a storm in a teacup. Do you agree with who sa Who said that? Some writers and uh, reporters. Uh, so, 300, more than 300 missile and drone attacks um, is an unprecedented action by Iran, uh, launched from Iranian territory, targeting the state of Israel. Um, now, ultimately, we were able to defend that because of our um, uh, important collaboration with Israel and with the Israeli Defense Forces, but that doesn't change the unprecedented nature of Iran's actions and the fact that uh, the international community needs to be united in condemning it. Uh, let, me, let me try to get to some people that I haven't gotten to yet. I'll, I'll, I'll come to you, Janie, I promise I'll come to you. In regards to the attacks on uh, Palestinian civilians over the last few days, do you, does the State Department view that Palestinians have a right to defend themselves, to self-defense? So when it comes to civilians, uh, obviously we're going to defer to, we want law enforcement to handle um, uh, those situations. Um, and we want to see Palestinian law enforcement uh, be able to work in the areas where they have uh, uh, lawful law enforcement capabilities. And we want to see the Israeli National Police in the places where they operate um, defend uh, Palestinians from illegal attacks. Uh, and we, on behalf of the United States, will continue to hold uh, accountable settlers that engage in that type of violence. But in the absence of such... We don't want to see any civilians taking the law into their own hands. We want to see law enforcement uh, act. But that is the but I, And that would be our position anywhere in the world. We want to see lawful authorities act appropriately, and that's what ought to happen in the West Bank, as, how would as one is true anywhere in the world. How would one defend himself, though, like defend their homes? Or do they have the right to defend? So their I'm homes? not going to get into kind of on the ground determinations uh, about anybody's specific home. Ultimately, we want to see de-escalation uh, in the West Bank, and that's why you saw uh, uh, me in the statement that I put out say that this is something that the government of Israel and the Palestinian Authority need to work to. We don't want to see. Um, armed Palestinians or armed Israelis taking matters into their own hands. Ultimately, that is how you see um, uh, an escalation in tensions in the West Bank, an escalation in violence in the West Bank. We want to see the Palestinian Authority and the government of Israel work to establish law and order and prevent this sort of violence. Okay, but is there a mechanism for Palestinians? Is there is there a mechanism for Palestinians to defend themselves, given the Palestinian Authority or the security? So uh, again, when it, uh, when you uh, when you mean if you mean individual Palestinians, we don't want to see them taking violent actions. But we don't want to see Israeli citizens taking violent actions either. The government of Israel, the Israeli National Police, the IDF, need to hold people accountable that take those types of actions, and that's what we'll continue to press for. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. On Thursday, April 11th of this year, you said that the Biden administration fully supports the rights of the Israeli people. And according to CNN and New York Times reports, President Biden has threatened Israel Prime Minister Netanyahu and the majority government to change course in their military actions or risk loss of his support for their military strategy with Hamas and Rafa area of Gaza. And, and now with Iran, how on one hand can you say that you fully support the rights of the Israeli people, and on the other hand, not fully support the rights of the Israeli people to defend themselves as they see fit, and a too brief follow-up. We do support Israel's right to defend itself, and we made that clear over the weekend. Okay, and then Israel has been under attack under, uh, from Iran and its proxies since before October 7th, with April 13th's attack by Iran being the worst and uh, not the first. Uh, why was the Biden administration and State Department, according to a recent CNN report, so quick to telegraph the U.S. would not support any counterattack of Israel on Iran? And, and then what would it take for America to retaliate against Iran since, according to an Associated Press report, Iran murdered three Americans and dozens more were injured in an overnight drone attack in northeast Jordan 
over the past several months. So first of all, um, with respect to that drone attack, we did take action uh, at the time, and that's been well discussed from here uh, and at the Pentagon. And then with respect to the first part of the, uh, of the question, uh, I'm not going to speak to private diplomatic conversations or reports about said private diplomatic conversations. But again, you don't have to look at our words to show that we are committed to the defense of Israel. Just look at the actions that we took over the weekend to shoot down uh, drones and missiles headed for Israel that would have uh, uh, hit Israeli targets, harmed the Israeli people, and the United States stood strong with Israel to defend it. What was the, prevent, what was the reason for, for, not, uh, for, for that, uh, uh, not allowing Israel to have a counterattack on uh, Iran? So Israel makes its own sovereign deci uh, decisions with respect to these questions. Okay, Go ahead, you. Jenny. Uh, China, South Korea, and North Korea. Uh, China's standing committee chairman Zhao Ruz met with uh, North Korea's Kim Jong Un last weekend, and pledged to strengthen high-level exchanges between China and uh, North Korea and build solidarity with anti-U.S. countries. My question is: Assistant Secretary Clinton Brink currently visiting China, will he discuss these issues with his counterparts? So certainly every time that we um, engage with our Chinese counterparts, whether it uh, is the secretary at his level or Assistant Secretary Critton Brink uh, at, his, at his, one of the things that uh, is always on the agenda is um, stability on the Korean Peninsula and preventing uh, uh, North Korea from realizing its nuclear ambitions. And uh, China is, uh, is threatening South Korea not to participate in the U.S. actions to keep China in check. What is the U.S. Uh, position? I, I, I don't have any comment on that. Why not? So uh, I, I'm not sure which reports you're referring to, um, but if you want to send them to me, I'd be happy to take because a look. Because they are China comment. and Russia. What's that? Because China and Russia and North Korea, I, I just don't. I, I, I'm not sure why not we South Korea going to get the U.S. I, side. Why they? I think I think we have made clear um, that we stand in solidarity with our South Korean allies uh, over a number of years. I'm just not sure what specific report you're referring to. That's why I didn't have a comment on it. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so, uh, as far as Iran's attack, what does it say about Iran's military capabilities, and uh, how do the uh, how does this attack affect? Uh, any diplomatic strategies between the U.S., Israel, and their allies? Well, what it says about their military capabilities is that they shot over 300 drones and missiles, and the vast majority of them did not make it through. What right. was the and second then, question? So, so then, be, uh, just to follow up on that, them being unsuccessful, does that say anything about their military capabilities? Uh, no, that's what I was just re responding to. Right. I don't right. have anything. For, I don't have a further assessment and to then, offer to that. And so, so d how did was there a change after that attack in the uh, diplomatic yeah. strategies between the U.S., Israel, and their allies? No, there has been no change uh, uh, in our the policy that we are have been trying to achieve since October 7th, in that we are trying to pr uh, pursue de-escalation and prevent the conflict from widening. As I said in response to an earlier question, you have seen the Secretary focus that uh, on this question since his very first trip to the region uh, in the days immediately after October 7th, and it's something that we have continued to pursue because we do not believe that a wider regional war is in anyone's interest. It's not in Iran's interest, not in Israel's interest, not in the interest of the broader broader region. So that's why we have tried to, um, uh, to prevent one and worked so hard to keep the conflict from escalating or from widening. Hold on. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So the Iranian regime said that they responded to the attack that occurred in Iraq, Damascus, against their consulate. So uh, my, my, my question is that what the United States uh, uh, positions now on that attack. Do you condemn that attack? Do you think that that attack against the Iranian consulate was appropriate, was wrong? What is the United States position? So we have not yet determined that that actually was an attack on a consulate. The status of that facility is something that we continue to assess. Another question, sorry. So the United States condemned uh, Iranians' attack against Israel. So what else the United States would do? Which kind of action the United States would take against Iran? So just condemned? So we are going to continue to hold them accountable. Uh, it's something that we have been discussing with our allies and partners over the weekend. I don't have any steps to preview today, um, uh, but it has been something that we have done since the outset of the administration uh, and something that we will continue to, to pursue. Go ahead. Yeah. Back. Thank you. 
that improving ties between the Iraqi federal government and the Kurdistan regional government is one issue that you are addressing with Prime Minister Sudan's visit. Could you explain that in more detail? Like, what issues will you address? So we are today uh, hosting senior Iraqi officials at the State Department for the second U.S.-Iraq Higher Coordinating Committee uh, meeting with the Sudani government. That is the uh, vehicle for our two governments to set priorities for future cooperation within the context of the 2008 U.S.-Iraq Strategic Framework Agreement. Uh, and we are discussing uh, through that uh, forum are shared bilateral priorities and partnership on a broad range of issues, including energy independence, financial reform, water, climate, transportation, strengthening democracy and the rule of law, and enhancing educational and cultural relations. Go ahead, Thank you very much, Michelle. Matt. Next. Thank you very much, Matt. Two questions. Uh, one question is that the Saudi foreign minister is in Pakistan uh, right now. Uh, what is something uh, from Pakistan and Saudi Arabia you would expect? Uh, to do to uh, improve the situation in uh, in the Middle East, and uh, whether them uh, both these countries accepting Israel will play any uh, constructive role uh, if their only demand of Palestine, which the Biden administration also supports, if that is done. So I'm not going to speak uh, speak to that specific visit or any uh, meetings in that regard. But in terms of work with Saudi Arabia, you saw the secretary speak to um, his Saudi counterpart. Yesterday, I think he spoke to him last Thursday or Wednesday. Um, we have continued to work with them, not just to de-escalate tensions in the immediate term, but to work for long -term, a long-term lasting resolution to the conflict and a pathway to two states, uh, and ultimately normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel that would provide regional peace and security for years to come. Thank you very much. And one more. Uh, yeah. My very nice uh, colleague and very well-known journalist for Pakistan, uh, uh, Hamid Mir, one of the top guys, uh, I'm just quoting his words that Pakistan right now has more suffocation than what it was like during General Zia days, General Musharraf days, uh, and six judges have resigned of the country. And he said, what if journalists starts giving resignation? Will that be enough to convince Matt that things in Pakistan are not good? Because I've given you examples of former prime ministers from former congressman from Pakistan. So uh, that things are not as flowery as you are showing so since color, the last two years about co Pakistan. Color me a bit skeptical, but I doubt that this person you mentioned uh, mentioned my name in, descri in, descri in describing this. Um, uh, but I would say, of course, we continue to work for freedom of expression in Pakistan. We continue to support the rule of law. That has not but changed. But that's not about go, freedom of expression, Matt. Can I? Go ahead. Thank you. Right now in Georgia, thousands of Georgians are protesting the Russian law, and meanwhile in the parliament, it seems like the ruling party is moving forward. The latest update from Georgia is that special forces are preparing for some actions against the protesters. So once again, regarding this law, if I may ask, uh, while the Georgian people, the entire West, uh, is condemning this law and only Russia supports it, how does it align uh, the strategic partnership between Georgia and the United States. So let me just say we remain deeply concerned that this draft legislation would harm civil society organizations working to improve the lives of Georgian citizens and would derail Georgia from its European path. Uh, we are also concerned that this draft legislation would impede independent media organizations working to provide uh, access for Georgian citizens to high quality information. But uh, because this remains draft legislation. I'm going to sort of leave it there today and not talk about uh, any implications should it actually be passed into law. And one more. Yeah. Last week, you urged Georgian officials to conduct further investigation to the four uh, judges sanctioned by the U.S. Did you have any communication on this subject with the Georgian officials? And uh, we see that instead of investigating, Georgian officials are demanding uh, that the sanctions must be Leave to it on that judges. So the three sanctions you mentioned um, uh, were put in place to promote accountability for malign actors who benefited from impunity, as well as uh, work to undermine the rule of law and the Georgian uh, Georgian public's faith in their judicial system. And uh, in terms of communications with the government of Georgia, of course, we encourage that government to take steps to promote accountability for uh, corrupt actors. Go ahead, Michelle, and then we'll wrap for today. Uh, do you have any reaction to uh, the attack on a bishop in uh, a church in Sydney, Australia, today? Um, let me take that back and, uh, and, and, get, your, and get your response. I'll, go, uh, I'll take one more. Go ahead. Thank you, Matt. I'm wondering if I may draw your attention to recent pieces on India. One is 
in foreign policy titled US-India ties remain, remain fundamentally fragile, and the other is titled Undemocratic Role of Modi's India is a Security Threat to South Asia, published in the South Asian Journal. With concern about democratic backsliding in India and recent concerns from the State Department regarding the crackdown on opposition, how will you navigate the relationship with India in coming days, including depending on India in, in the Pacific strategy? So India is the world's largest democracy. It is an important strategic partner of the United States, and I expect that to remain true. Uh, we'll wrap, with that we'll wrap for today. Thanks, everyone.